Okay, in this lecture, we're going to talk about solids. And we're going to start off by describing really two broad classifications of solids that there are. First, there's crystalline. And this is what we're usually familiar with when it comes to solids. We're trying to develop, and I should say this at the beginning here, we're trying to develop really this picture of what the atoms look like at the molecular scale. And, and you'll see that's a real uh, tenet of the course that I teach in general chemistry too, is it's all about trying to think like the atom or think like the molecule, develop some of this intuition uh, for the concepts of general chemistry by putting yourself in the molecule's shoes. And so today we're going to be looking at the different types of uh, organizations of these atoms and molecules. And starting off with, we're going to broadly define these as either crystalline or amorphous. And with crystalline, this is the nice, neat, orderly stacking of atoms that we're used to. Right? And we call this a crystal lattice. And so a lot of solids we think of uh, fall into this real crystalline network structure. Okay? Everything's nice, neat, orderly. Uh, you can predict, you know, the shape of this crystalline solid based on how the ions or atoms fit together. The other type of solid is amorphous. And this is a bit harder to draw a picture for because it's not this nice, neat, repeated structure. And so, yeah, you could draw one part of an amorphous solid, but the other part might look like a chain of atoms together. Right? There's no easy thing to draw to describe an amorphous solid, and that's because it's got the randomness, really, that's inherent to liquids. So these different atoms might be oriented in, in different uh, positions, some close to other atoms, some further away. If there's, you know, three or four atoms grouped together, uh, the first set of three to four atoms might be pointing in a different direction than the next set of three to four atoms. And so you really have the randomness of liquids uh, without the kinetic energy to really characterize them as a liquid. And if you're not sure about solids versus liquids versus gases, it's really a battle between this amount of kinetic, kinetic energy and the intermolecular forces. You can go back and watch some of the previous lectures uh, to clear that up for you. So an amorphous solid is kind of like this liquid picture that we've imagined in previous lectures locked into place. Things are pointing in different directions. It's not this nice, neat, orderly crystalline lattice. And so all solids really are gonna be divided into crystalline or amorphous. A lot of what we'll talk today about is crystalline solids and amorphous we'll discuss in future lectures. So we can break this down further into the different types of solids, not just crystalline and amorphous, which really speaks to the type of physical structure, but different classes of these solids. And so here we have four, and we'll have two more on the next slide, uh, classifying these solids based on the types of chemical bonds. So metallic solids are gonna be the first type. And these are when the atoms are held together by a sea of collectively shared electrons. So let's first imagine each atom as this positive sphere, and they're all identical, even if I'm not able to draw them quite that way. And it's this nice, neat, crystalline, solid structure. This one's clearly too big. Slightly better there. And now we have this repeating spaced apart type of metallic structure. Maybe there's some more up here, right? Now, these are all positively charged because they've lost some electrons, but they haven't really lost them. Really what's happening here in a metallic solid, and we'll look at this closer, is that all the electrons are sort of delocalized together around the surface, right? So this here, are the electrons. It's this like electron cloud, or sometimes you'll see this as an electron seat. And you know, this is probably the most common type of solid we're used to thinking about, a metallic solid, right? So think of, you know, pure iron or something, uh, where you have all these iron cations and some of their valence electrons, they all pool together and create this sea of collectively shared electrons. And we'll see in a bit how that lends or explains, I should say, the properties of these metallic solids. Uh, the next type of solid we'll look at um, is ionic solids. And here, 
this is a bit different. Okay, here what we're going to have is oscillating ions that pack themselves together in some repeating nature. And so while it kind of looks like a metallic solid in terms of organization, it's actually much different. And the reason it's different is because up here, there is no physical chemical bond between the metals, right? They're all sort of held close to each other by this surrounding sea of electrons, where here there's a definitive ionic bond. So the difference here with my ionic solid is each of this is actually a Coulombic attraction between the neighbors. Okay, and so this is something like sodium chloride, where the sodium becomes positively charged, the chlorine becomes negatively charged, and now they're attracted to them. So each of these things here is an ionic bond. Covalent network solids will be the third type we're going to talk about. And an example of this is something like uh, diamond. Uh, here you have all of these neutral atoms that are bound to other neutral atoms. Through these covalent bonds. So this is pretty easy to differentiate between ionic and covalent solids because it's just a characteristic of the types of bonds that are between the atoms and connecting them. The last type is a molecular solid. And here, kind of like metallic solids, we're not talking about a chemical bond. Here, a molecular solid is going to be something like water where what's holding one water to another water molecule is the hydrogen bond that develops between the H on one water and the oxygen on another water. So here, the critical thing holding the different <clears throat> molecules together are intermolecular forces. In this case, it's a hydrogen bond, but it could be a dispersion force. It could be a dipole-dipole force, for example. And so those are four of the main types of uh, solids a lot of these are crystalline or will be crystalline yes you can have amorphous types of these but often these are crystalline types of uh, structures where you have this repeated unit as shown on the left here we can also have two other types of polymers that are certainly more recent compared to these uh, long-standing types of solids one is polymers think of plastics and these are really really long chains of atoms okay that are connected by covalent bonds so a lot of times these are hydrocarbons right think H, C, 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 but this keeps going for a really long time. And it goes for such a long time that, well, this is a big floppy molecule that can cross itself. And you basically have this big long chain. Everything ends up looking like spaghetti. It folds over on itself. Okay. And so this can quite look quite amorphous in nature, right? And the chains can be connected to other chains by weak forces. So it can be kind of molecular in look because there might be this long, you know, squiggly polymer, long carbon chain, you know, that's attracted to another long carbon chain down here. Okay, so these are polymers. They're really just long covalently bound molecules, but they get so long that they fold on top of one another and create uh, some unique properties. Now, they might be based on some small type of molecule like a hydrocarbon. And this might explain some of the properties, but they're gonna be different than you know, molecular solids built of that type of hydrocarbon. Because they're so much longer, you get these new types of properties. The last one is nanomaterials. And there's not really a, a drawing I can make for this other than to say that you know, these structures are not maybe metallic solids that go on forever such that we can see them on the macroscopic scale. Really, these are a few atoms put together such that the overall size of this is somewhere in the one to 100 nanometer regime. So this is just taking any of these other types of solids and shrinking them down to the nanoscale. And if you learned anything about quantum mechanics, properties end up being different on the nanoscale. Physics, matter behaves quite differently, so the properties you get out of these things as you shrink them down are quite different. Okay, so that's really the uh, six different types of solids that you can classify most 
solid compounds into. Now, we're going to expand each of these and discuss them at length, and this uh, rest of this video will discuss metallic bonding. In future lectures, we'll get into all other five of these types, ionic, covalent, molecular, polymers, and nanomaterials. But for the rest of this lecture, we're going to concentrate on metallic solids. A good opportunity to really uh, think about what the electrons are doing and what explains this sea of electrons character. So again, we've already sort of drawn it, but we can think of these as a bunch of metal atoms that give up some amount of electrons such that they're all just positive ions in this nice, neat, ordered structure. These electrons they've given up, right, aren't to neighboring atoms, but belong to sort of all the atoms at the same time. And so it's this group of cations, these metal atoms I've shown here with positive charges, in this sea of electrons. And I'll use E negative for my electrons. Now, the electrical and thermal conductivity, ductility and malleability of metals is explained by this model. So think about this bunch of protons, right? Not really protons, bunch of cations, I should say, in this sea of electrons. You could imagine that within this sea of electron, you know, this could kind of be unimpeded to move up around here. If I put a little, push a little force, right? If I push a little force in this direction, maybe I can easily move some of these atoms, right? Because they all exist within this large sea of electrons, there's not really a chemical bond that's going to push back and prevent me from translating this atom over to here, right? And maybe I move this atom over to here. And maybe I can move the other two atoms over to here. And maybe I'm hammering on this metal to do so, right? That's called malleability. When you take a hammer and you can sort of hammer out into a flat shape this metallic structure. You could also hammer it a lot more or draw it out into a wire. So this was malleability here. You can also explore the ductility, which is just drawing all of these atoms out until they're a thin type of wire. Again, this model that the cations are suspended in this sort of soup or sea of electrons means they're kind of free, right? They like where they're at, but they're kind of free to move around if enough energy is provided to move them around. So, you know, us humans being quite bigger and stronger than these atoms uh, most of the time can reorganize them into this sheet malleability or this wire ductility. Now, the electrical and thermal conductivity really has to take a better look at what it means to be a sea of electrons. And for that, we really need a review of molecular orbital theory. Some of this you should have had in a previous chemistry course, but I'll review some of molecular orbital theory that we're gonna need to explain this sea of electrons. Let's start with some overall sort of tenets of molecular orbital theory. And the first tenet of molecular, molecular orbital theory is that atomic orbitals, which I'll abbreviate AO here, overlap and combine to make molecular orbitals. Or MOs. So the MO here is molecular orbitals. Okay, so this is when you have two atomic orbitals right, on two separate atoms, the atoms get close together, then their orbitals overlap. So, you know, you can imagine this p orbital of atom one and this p orbital of atom two getting close enough together that now the top and the bottom overlap. And really what you create is some overlap above and overlap below the nuclei. So if I was looking at where the nuclei are in these things, you know, I might put them at the very center here, and here they are. Okay, and we call this above and below a pi bond, right? But it's a molecular orbital here, 
because it's built out of these atomic orbitals, this p orbital and this p orbital make this pi orbital. Okay, tenet number two of molecular orbital theory is that each of these molecular orbitals that I make can hold zero, one, or two electrons. Now, what's really important here is, well, if it's holding zero electrons, it looks like it doesn't matter, right? Not so. Because some of these molecular orbitals that hold zero electrons, you might be able to promote an electron to that state. So you still have to worry about these empty molecular orbitals that have zero electrons, because you might be able to move electrons from one orbital into it. And that really defines a lot of the properties of electrical conductivity, as we'll see in a second. The third tenet here of molecular orbital theory is that the number of molecular orbitals equals the number of atomic orbitals I'm combining. And we'll see this in practice on the next slide, but up here, if you're combining two atomic orbitals, so this was atomic orbital number one, this is atomic orbital number two. The overlap suggests I can create this pi bond above and below the nuclei. Well, it must also mean if I'm combining two atomic orbitals, I must get two molecular orbitals. So it's not only that I make this bonding type of molecular orbital where there is favorable overlap here, but I can also make this antibonding molecular orbital. And so that's tenant here, uh, tenant three here, that I can get and will get two molecular orbitals out, a bonding and an antibonding, when I combine two atomic orbitals. And so what does the antibonding look like? Well, then the overlap is not favorable. So instead of getting that bonding characteristic, what you get when you overlap these two is that the electron clouds don't want to give you this bonding character and kind of get pushed away from one another, right? So this bonding character of this atomic orbital gets pushed away from the other atomic orbital and you get something that looks kind of like this poorly drawn butterfly type of structure here. And you get what's called a node down the middle. Right, so that's unfavorable, that's higher in energy than your bonding case. But it's important to keep track that for each of these two atomic orbitals, you're gonna get two molecular orbitals. The fourth tenet of molecular orbital theory is that as we add electrons to these orbitals, it depends whether those molecular orbitals are bonding or antibonding. Okay, so adding electrons to bonding molecular orbitals strengthens a chemical bond. While adding electrons to an antibonding orbital does the opposite. It weakens that chemical bond. And so this is really easy if you make a molecular orbital diagram for something like hydrogen, where each hydrogen atom adds one electron. You have two electrons total. Both of the electrons fit in this bonding molecular orbital, right, which makes the molecule stable. So if you thought about a hydrogen and a hydrogen atomic orbital, there's an S and an S, they can make a bonding type or they can make a antibonding type with a node down the middle. This is my energy axis here. The antibonding is higher in energy. Well, since each hydrogen has one electron, both of these electrons can go into this molecular orbital down here. And so overall, you're stabilizing this because you're putting both of these atomic one electrons from hydrogen into this bonding molecular orbital that's happy. Now imagine what happens if instead of hydrogen, it's helium, which has two electrons, and this is helium, which has two. Well, now not only do two have to go in here, but two have to go in this antibonding molecular orbital. 
and this really weakens the chemical bond. So you don't typically see helium-2 exist because the atoms don't want to stay attached to each other if they're having to put their electrons in these antibonding molecular orbitals. So it doesn't. And helium-2 doesn't really exist, but hydrogen-2 does. Again, because the electrons end up in a bonding and your antibonding is open. Okay, so that's a brief uh, sort of intro and review of molecular orbital theory. Now, with all that said, let's think about moving a bit bigger here than just two atoms. So let's build up a metallic solid. Let's think of maybe lithium here. And for lithium, let me make a scale here. This is energy on this axis. Lithium has 1s2, 2s1, and the 1s2 electrons will be very core-like in nature. The 2s1 electron, that's valence. So let's look at, for lithium, here's its 2s electron. Now, if I wanted to think about another lithium getting close to this lithium, what can happen? Well, this 2s electron right here, and this 2s electron right here, as they approach one another, right, they can bond and form this overlap. I should probably use the same sort of coordination I did for the nuclei. And that's a favorable uh, bonding sort of scenario. Uh, however, they could create an antibonding orbital, and they will. just like the hydrogen example we just showed, right? And there will be a node down the middle of this antibonding molecular orbital. So again, you're taking the 2s1 electron, the single electron of lithium, the single electron of lithium, as these atoms approach one another, their electrons see one another, the atomic orbitals morph into this molecular orbital shown here, and the electrons fill this bonding molecular orbital. There aren't enough electrons to fill this next state. The bonding molecular orbital is completely full. And so this is a very happy, stabilized lithium-2 molecule. Okay, so this is what lithium-2 looks like. Let's instead think of lithium-4. Now, it's hard to draw in this two-dimensional space, but if you had lithium-4, each of those lithium atoms is contributing a 2s atomic orbital. So for lithium-2, we got two molecular orbitals, one here and one here. So for lithium-4, we'll get four molecular orbitals by combining these four atomic orbitals in four different ways. And they'll look like this. The first will be here, the second here, the third here, and the fourth maybe here. What will they look like? Well, this bottom one, the most stable one, is going to be when they're all the same sign and phase, and these four lithium atoms combine in such a way that the electrons completely overlap and are delocalized across all four atoms, right? That is the net best effect of combining these four electrons. And so you get this molecular orbital down here where the electron, sorry, the, the sign of the electrons as they come together are all the same and create this bonding molecular orbital. The next molecular orbital will have one node. So there'll be a sort of quasi-bonding molecular orbital over here and a quasi-bonding molecular orbital over here. There will be a node down the middle, and these two atoms are sharing this phase of the electron, and this, these two atoms are sharing uh, this phase of the uh, electron wave function. Now there's going to be two more molecular orbitals up here. This will have two nodes. So again, the gaps that I'm showing are the nodes. And this is the third molecular orbital. Again, I'm combining four S-type atomic orbitals. 
right, which are just four spheres, like here. I can combine all four the same exact way and get this. I can combine two and two like this with one node. I can combine two in the center and have one on each side like this. Or I can have all four that are sort of by themselves. Like this. And the nodes raise the energy, right? The electron actually wants to be free like it is uh, down here, delocalized over all four atoms. That's why it's lower in energy on this scale. Up here, this is the highest energy state. So now with four atoms, I get these four molecular orbitals. And notice one thing that happens, right? This is the really important part here. This is a review of molecular orbital theory. We're kind of glossing over some things here because we have learned this in a previous class. Uh, the important part in terms of solids is that notice what's happening for the gap here between the occupied molecular orbital and the unoccupied molecular orbital. And why this is important is because if I'm going to add energy to this lithium-2 molecule, where can I move the electron? It has to jump this gap, right? Now with four, if each lithium has one electron, well, I put two here and two here. This is still a favorable scenario. Why? Because the energy of the lithiums has been lowered to here and here. Look at the molecular orbitals and their energies drawn on this y-axis, this energy scale. Overall, lithium-4 is stable and exists because of the molecular orbitals are bonding in character mostly and overall lowers the energy relative to four separate lithium atoms. Now, we'll highlight again this gap here between the last occupied molecular orbital here and the first unoccupied molecular orbital here. Again, why is that important? Because if I want to add energy to lithium-4, I have to overcome this gap. Okay, so that's two lithiums, that's four lithiums. You could do eight. Okay, maybe uh, let's do a mole of lithium. So lithium 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. And let's draw each of the 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecular orbitals. I'm kidding. That would uh, take us literally longer than the history of the universe. The important point is, is that as you go from 2 to 4 to 8 to 16, these things get spaced closer and closer together, and the gap between them, the highest occupied and the lowest unoccupied, shrinks. Okay? And so as you go to a mole of lithiums, you can imagine there's a mole of these molecular orbitals and there's a mole of these unoccupied molecular orbitals, right? Where each of these lines is one of these molecular orbitals. So what's critical here is that the spacing, right, between two states, here it's obvious these states are spaced apart. Here, they're basically blurring together. They're so closely spaced. Instead of calling these states, I call these a band. And this is what's important in solids, is that you have this band theory, okay? Up here, the unoccupied states that lend themselves to these unoccupied bands are called a conduction band. And here it's unoccupied for lithium with a mole of atomic orbitals combining, you get a mole of molecular orbitals. Half of those are in this valence band and are occupied, and half of those will be in the conduction band and are unoccupied. The last thing to notice here is that there is basically no gap here 
between the valence band and conduction band, right? Just as these get spaced really close together and these get spaced really close together, the spacing between valence band and conduction band basically goes to zero. And so here's the important part. Whereas the amount of energy here I have to add to lithium-2 to promote an electron is a lot. It is this much energy, that energy gap, and it is right a little bit less here. By the time I get up to a whole bunch of lithiums together in this solid form, there is no gap. So there's nothing preventing an electron moving from one state to the other, okay? And so as the number of atoms in this atomic chain creating this crystal structure of the metal increases, the energy gap between the bonding orbitals and between the antibonding orbitals, which we're calling the valence band that has now arisen, versus the conduction band, that disappears. And so there's this continuous band of energy. And if you want to move electrons around, it basically is free. It costs you no energy to promote. Whereas here in the isolated lithium-4 state or the lithium-2 state, you had to supply a decent amount of energy. Here, there's basically no gap. And, you know, subtly heating this or adding energy, you can move the electrons around. Now, a lot of metals aren't so simple like lithium, okay? They might have S and P valence electrons. They might have S and D. They might have S, P, and D electrons. And so what you end up getting for something like aluminum here, and I think that's the example we could go with here, where it has uh, two S electrons and one P electron, right? Valence is 3S2, 3P1, right? As these evolve from aluminum 1 to aluminum 2 to aluminum 12, to aluminum, a mole of aluminums, because now it's a sheet of foil or something. So aluminum 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Now look at its valence band and conduction band. Okay, they overlap in energy, right? This is fanning out into this band structure. And this is fanning out into this band structure. Right, and the same is happening here and here. So if this gap, isn't too big, well, they evolve into bands that are overlapping. Again, doesn't cost you anything to promote an electron to a next higher state. The electrons are organized in this band structure, but if I add energy to aluminum, I can easily move one of the electrons to the next higher state. Why? Because these states are so closely spaced together that eventually or essentially costs me nothing. And so this is sort of a molecular orbital approach to understand what it really means to have this sea of electrons. And why do these metals conduct electricity? And it's because the electrons aren't really bound in some covalent or ionic bond here. They're free to roam around, and they're free to roam around, well, because of the very nature of how the molecular orbitals are built, and as you add more and more atoms together, you get all these states very, very close together. So if you add a little bit of energy, they're free to move around. And this is how electrical conduction works. So that is our molecular orbital theory look and our structural look at metallic bonding and classifying all these different types of solids. In the next lecture, we will move into the different types we covered at the outset here, going as deep as we did here with metallic bonding into ionic, covalent, and molecular. And after that, in a separate lecture, getting into polymers and nanomaterials as we try to cover all the different types of solids you could have. So that'll do it for this lecture. See you next time.